The pine trees swayed with a nervous energy, whispering secrets to each other as if they knew something I didn't. It was 2003, deep in the heart of Shoshone National Forest in Wyoming, where the quiet had a way of making a person feel small. I've always been the type to find solace in nature, the kind of guy who thought a weekend in the wilderness would clear my head. I'm Gideon Welker, a park ranger who traded a desk job for the great outdoors. It seemed like a good idea at the time, a fresh start from the corporate grind that had sucked my soul dry. A week into my shift, everything had been routine, checking trails, speaking to campers, and keeping an eye on the wildlife. The most exciting thing that had happened was a family of raccoons raiding a picnic site. I chuckled at the image of those little bandits. But all that changed when I came across a strange warning scrawled in the dirt near a popular hiking trail. Turn back or else. I brushed it off as some prank by bored teenagers. The only thing I had to worry about was keeping the bears away from the campsites, or so I thought. Little did I know that day would unravel into something unthinkable. Later that evening, as the sun dipped below the mountains, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, I made my way to the visitor center. I hoped to catch up with Lisa, my fellow ranger and the only person who could share a laugh about the raccoons. Hey Lisa, I called as I walked in. The air was thick with the scent of brewing coffee. She was sitting behind the desk, surrounded by maps and brochures. You ever seen a warning like this before? I waved the dirt-covered stick in the air. Lisa looked up, eyebrows raised. What warning? I explained the message. Instead of laughter, her expression turned serious. You might want to check with the locals. They know the area better than anyone. With a reluctant nod, I decided to take her advice. The local diner was the heart of the community, a place where gossip flowed as freely as coffee. As I entered, the familiar jingle of the door greeted me and the smell of bacon hit me like a warm hug. The diner was buzzing, but it quieted down as soon as I stepped in. I approached the counter where a man named Earl, a hefty fellow with a beard as wild as the forest itself, stood flipping pancakes. What's the word around here? I asked, trying to lighten the mood. Earl paused, flipping a pancake with flair. You ain't heard? Folks been saying there's something out there, something that don't belong. I snorted, like a bear that can't find its way home. His eyes narrowed. Nah, son, this is something different. They say it's not from around here, not like anything we know. Just as I was about to laugh it off, a woman in the corner, her face lined with worry, spoke up. It's true. My husband went missing last week on that very trail you mentioned. He said he saw something strange. A chill crept up my spine. Strange? Like what? Something that didn't make sense. He didn't come back. The laughter I hoped to share with Lisa faded into a pit of unease. I thanked them for their input and left the diner, my mind racing. I had planned to dismiss the warning, but now I felt an odd sense of dread settling in. I decided to scout the area where I'd found the warning and see if I could find anything unusual. As I made my way through the winding paths, the forest around me shifted. The chirping of birds faded, replaced by an eerie silence. It felt as though the woods themselves were holding their breath. I pushed onward, determined to find something, anything, that could make sense of the warning. Just as I reached a small clearing, I caught a glimpse of something unusual. A flash of movement caught my eye, but when I turned to look, nothing was there. My heart raced. Perhaps it was just my imagination, or maybe a deer startled by my presence. I scanned the area, trying to shake the sense of foreboding that hung in the air. Then I heard it. A soft rustling behind me, almost like breathing. I spun around, adrenaline surging. The trees loomed tall and dark, their branches swaying slightly in the wind. I peered deeper into the underbrush, trying to decipher the source of the sound. Nothing. Just shadows and branches. Get a grip, Gideon. I muttered to myself. I turned to head back, but the rustling came again, closer this time. My instincts kicked in and I moved toward the noise, thinking perhaps it was a lost animal. I was trained to handle wildlife after all. I stepped carefully, each crunch of leaves beneath my boots echoing in the stillness. The rustling grew louder, more pronounced. As I approached a thick cluster of bushes, my heart pounded in my chest. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up and then I saw it. 
Emerging from the shadows was something that defied explanation. It stood on all fours, but its limbs were elongated almost unnaturally so. The body was covered in matted fur and its shape reminded me of a wolf, but with a hunched back and a twisted face that could only be described as grotesque. It paused, sniffing the air as if it had caught my scent. Every rational thought fled as panic surged through me. I reached for my radio, but my hand shook so badly that I couldn't get a grip. The creature locked onto my gaze, and for a moment, time seemed to freeze. I was frozen in place, caught in the web of its stare. The beast lunged. Instinct took over. I turned and ran, branches slashing at my face as I tore through the underbrush. I heard it behind me, heavy footsteps crashing through the underbrush. Every ounce of training urged me to stay calm, but all I could hear was the pounding of my heart and the beast's breath behind me. Suddenly, I stumbled, hitting the ground hard. My radio flew out of my hands, skidding across the dirt. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the sting of pain and made a beeline for the trail, desperately hoping I could outpace it. I burst onto the main trail, gasping for breath. I had to reach the visitor center, alert others. I could hear it getting closer, the sound of its claws digging into the ground, gaining on me. As I sprinted down the path, I caught sight of the visitor center up ahead. I pushed myself harder, adrenaline fueling every step. I burst through the doors, slamming them behind me. Lisa, I shouted, frantically looking around the empty room. She rushed in from the back, her expression shifting from confusion to alarm. What happened? There's something out there. A creature. It's... Before I could finish, the door rattled violently. My heart dropped. Did you lock it? I asked, trying to control my voice. I thought I did. She dashed to the door and shoved a heavy bench against it. I grabbed my radio, finally managing to get a grip on it. We need to call for backup, now! As I fumbled with the radio, the door buckled under the weight of the beast outside. Lisa and I exchanged a glance, fear pooling in our stomachs. Just then, the door burst open, flinging the bench aside like it was a toy. The creature stormed in, its twisted body lit by the dim light of the center. The stench of wet fur filled the air as it stepped inside, letting out a guttural sound that echoed off the walls. Run! I shouted, grabbing Lisa's hand. We darted to the back exit, praying the creature wouldn't follow. We burst into the wilderness again, but there was no clear path. I led Lisa deeper into the woods, the beast's howls trailing behind us. My mind raced as I tried to remember the layout of the park. We needed to get to the nearest cabin to barricade ourselves and wait for help. The trees closed in around us, each step heavy with dread. We moved as quietly as possible, the crunch of twigs beneath our feet sounding like thunder. I could hear the beast crashing through the underbrush, its growls echoing around us. Suddenly we came upon an old ranger cabin, its paint peeling and windows shattered. It looked abandoned, but we didn't have a choice. I pulled the door open and we stepped inside slamming it shut behind us. The cabin was dark, the air stale. I fumbled for a light switch and found one. The bulb flickered to life, revealing a dusty room filled with old equipment. Do you think it saw us? Lisa whispered, her voice trembling. Maybe, I replied, scanning the room for something to barricade the door. As I pushed a table against it, I could hear the creature outside, its footsteps heavy against the wooden porch. I found a couple of old hunting rifles in the corner. They were dusty and rusty, but they could work. Gideon, Lisa said, her voice barely above a whisper. What if it gets in? I gritted my teeth, trying to block out the sound of the creature. We'll handle it. Just stay quiet. With the rifles in hand, we positioned ourselves near the windows, waiting for the inevitable confrontation. My heart pounded in my chest as we listened to the creature's movements outside. After what felt like an eternity, the door rattled again, and I took aim. The door splintered as the beast charged forward. I squeezed the trigger, the blast echoing through the cabin. The creature let out a roar of pain and staggered back. It hit it! Lisa exclaimed, her eyes wide with shock. But it quickly recovered, more furious than before. It charged again, and this time the door flew off its hinges, sending wood splintering everywhere. The creature lunged at us. I fired again, hitting its side. It screeched, revealing teeth like a jagged shark's, glistening in the dim light. But instead of retreating, it pushed forward, slashing its claws toward us. The fight was chaotic. 
I felt a rush of adrenaline as I ducked and dodged, firing another shot. The cabin shook with each explosion, dust falling from the ceiling as the creature snarled and thrashed. In the chaos, I noticed something. Its movements were erratic, almost desperate. It wasn't just a predator, it was scared. Gideon, it's coming for you, Lisa yelled, and I pivoted just in time to dodge another swipe of its claw. I realized this creature wasn't here to kill for sport. It was driven by something deeper, fear maybe, or a need to defend its territory. I had no idea what had happened to the previous hikers, but it felt like a misunderstood beast caught in a corner. I fired once more, hitting its leg. It stumbled, and I saw a moment of hesitation in its eyes. Lisa, help me, I shouted, desperate to take control of the situation. She grabbed a chair and threw it at the creature, distracting it just long enough for me to approach. Stay back, I yelled, trying to calm it. Gideon, what are you doing? Lisa cried. But I couldn't let it die. Not like this. I took a deep breath, standing my ground. You don't want to hurt us. We're not your enemy. The creature paused, its breath heavy and labored. It eyed me cautiously, and I could sense its confusion. Just, just back away slowly, I whispered, moving my hands in a calming gesture. Lisa watched in horror, but I pressed on. Let's just talk. You've been hurt, I can see that. For a heartbeat, it seemed to understand. It lowered its head slightly, panting. The tension in the room hung thick as we exchanged a silent understanding. Then, without warning, it lunged again. But this time, I was ready. I sidestepped and fired. The shot hit its shoulder and the beast yelped. It turned and ran back into the darkness, leaving us panting in the cabin. We stood in silence the aftermath of the encounter settling in. I turned to Lisa, and we exchanged a look that said more than words ever could. When we finally made it back to the visitor center, the sun was beginning to rise, painting the sky with streaks of pink and gold. I reported the encounter, and we set up a team to search the area. The search team found the creature's body later, mangled but intact, just a few yards from where I had first spotted it. The report that followed mentioned how it had been a previously undiscovered species now extinct. They thought it was a rogue animal, perhaps displaced from its natural habitat due to climate changes or hunting pressures. The town rallied around our story, a blend of awe and horror surrounding the creature. I became somewhat of a local legend, the ranger who faced the beast and lived to tell the tale. Lisa and I often laughed about the whole thing over coffee. The terrifying night transformed into a story we would share for years to come. As the seasons changed, so did the forest. The memory of that night lingered like a ghost, a reminder of the unpredictability of nature, the raw power of the wild that could both terrify and captivate. But life went on, and I returned to my daily duties, always keeping an eye on the woods, knowing full well that there were mysteries hidden in those trees that would never be fully understood. And that was okay, too. Sometimes, it's the unknown that keeps the world interesting. The wind rustled through the pine trees and the smell of damp earth filled the air. It was 1997, and I was stationed in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Washington State. My name is Warren Hargrove. After a rough patch in my life, a divorce that left me questioning my choices, I found solace in the forest. The quiet stillness of the trees felt like a warm embrace. Being a park ranger allowed me to connect with nature and escape the chaos of my past. But that day was different. There was an unease in the air, a feeling I couldn't quite shake. As I made my rounds, checking trails and ensuring the campgrounds were clear, I noticed how the usual chirping of birds had fallen silent. A thick fog rolled in, wrapping the forest in a heavy blanket, limiting visibility to mere feet ahead. The world around me felt like it had slipped into a different dimension, one that was both familiar and terrifying. While I patrolled a remote section of the forest, I stumbled across a campsite that seemed recently abandoned. A half-burnt campfire smoldered, and a tent lay flapped open, flapping eerily in the wind. The air grew thick with an ominous tension. I called out, hoping to find the campers, but all that echoed back was silence. Curiosity pulled me closer. As I stepped inside the tent, I saw a backpack still full of supplies. 
it felt wrong like something was off. I rummaged through it, finding personal items, clothes, a wallet with a driver's license, but no one was around. My heart raced. Something didn't add up. I radioed into the station, but the transmission crackled and faded. As I stepped out, I felt a presence behind me, like a weight in the air. I turned quickly, half expecting to see another camper, but instead found only the fog swirling around me. Just then, the ground beneath me shifted. A low growl reverberated through the trees. My instincts kicked in and I bolted back to my truck, locking the doors behind me. That's when I noticed the tracks leading away from the campsite, large clawed prints, unlike anything I had ever seen. They weren't animal tracks I recognized, and they seemed to disappear into the dense underbrush. I cursed under my breath. My gut was telling me to leave, but curiosity held me captive. I needed to know what was out there. As I followed the tracks deeper into the forest, the air grew colder. The trees loomed overhead like silent sentinels, their twisted branches reaching out as if to warn me to turn back. The deeper I went, the more I could feel something watching me, waiting. I tried to shake off the feeling, rationalizing that it was just my imagination running wild. Eventually, I stumbled upon an old, dilapidated cabin. It looked abandoned, and the windows were boarded up. It had a sinister quality to it, like a relic of a forgotten time. Caution screamed at me to retreat, yet I pushed the door open. It creaked ominously, revealing a dark interior filled with dust and decay. Inside, I found remnants of someone's life, old photographs, newspapers, and furniture covered in a thick layer of dust. But it was the walls that caught my attention. Strange symbols and markings were etched into the wood, forming a bizarre pattern. A chill raced through me as I realized they resembled the shapes of the clawed tracks I had seen earlier. I was suddenly struck by a memory, a story I had heard from locals about a creature that haunted these woods. It was said to be a protector of the forest, an ancient spirit that had grown restless and violent. Most people dismissed it as a campfire tale, but now, standing in this eerie cabin, I wasn't so sure. Before I could process what I was feeling, a noise broke the silence. A rustle outside sent my heart racing. I peeked out the window but saw nothing, just the mist swirling eerily, swallowing the trees. Then, without warning, the door to the cabin slammed shut. The noise echoed like a gunshot in the stillness, and I felt a rush of adrenaline surge through me. I was not alone. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my chest. The growling I had heard earlier grew louder, echoing off the cabin walls. I felt a primal instinct kick in. I had to get out. I ran for the door, yanking it open and bolted into the fog. The cold air bit at my skin as I dashed back toward my truck, the growling echoing behind me. As I sprinted through the trees, I caught sight of something moving in the fog. It was massive, larger than any bear I'd ever seen. It moved with a grace that belied its size, a predator stalking its prey. I could see the dark silhouette, its form shifting like smoke as it navigated through the trees. I screamed for help, but the words were swallowed by the fog. Suddenly it lunged at me and I barely dodged its attack. It was fast, too fast. I could feel the rush of wind as it passed, narrowly avoiding me. I stumbled, nearly falling, and regained my footing just in time to hear it growl again a low rumble that resonated through my bones. I ran for what felt like forever, the forest closing in around me. My heart raced as I frantically looked for a place to hide. In a panic, I ducked behind a large fallen tree, its trunk thick and weathered. I held my breath, praying it wouldn't find me. I could hear the creature prowling nearby, its movements deliberate, circling like a predator. My thoughts raced. What was I dealing with? I thought of the stories again, of the forest spirit that turned vengeful. But this felt different. This was something real, something terrifying. Then I heard voices. A group of hikers emerged from the fog, blissfully unaware of the danger lurking just beyond their view. They were laughing, joking about the trek ahead. I wanted to shout to warn them, but the instinct to remain hidden overpowered me. I watched helplessly as they continued deeper into the woods, unaware of the impending doom. Suddenly, the creature lunged again, this time at the hikers. The laughter turned to screams, and I felt the air grow thick with terror. They scattered, confusion and fear gripping them. My heart sank. I couldn't just hide anymore. I had to help them. 
I sprang from my hiding place, adrenaline fueling my legs as I charged toward them, yelling for them to run. The creature was faster. It took one of the hikers down with a swift, brutal attack. I felt sick, but I couldn't stop. I shouted again, urging the others to escape. The remaining hikers turned, their faces pale with fear as they scrambled away. But one of them, a young woman named Lila, hesitated, looking back toward her friend. I grabbed her arm and pulled her forward, urgency flooding through me. We had to get out of the forest. The growls grew more ferocious, echoing through the trees. We ran as fast as we could, dodging branches and roots. I could hear the chaos behind us, the sounds of the creature attacking. I dared not look back. My only focus was on getting Lila and myself to safety. We reached my truck and I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking. The creature's growl echoed closer and I felt a surge of panic. Finally, the door swung open and we jumped inside, slamming it shut behind us. I fumbled for the ignition and the engine roared to life. As I threw the truck into gear, I glanced back, catching a glimpse of the creature through the fog. It was massive, its fur bristling and glistening with a sheen that looked almost unnatural. It stood there, blocking our path, snarling with teeth that gleamed in the fading light. But there was something else I noticed. It wasn't just a beast. It looked... familiar. The contours of its body, the way it moved, reminded me of something I couldn't place. Before I could analyze it further, I pressed the gas pedal to the floor and we sped away, the truck rattling as we barreled down the forest road. The fog began to lift, revealing the familiar landmarks of the park. I turned to Lila, who was trembling in her seat, her face pale. We had made it, but the reality of what we'd witnessed settled in. We reached the ranger station and I immediately radioed for backup. The rangers listened in disbelief as I recounted the chaos. There was nothing but silence on the other end, a lingering dread settling over us all. A few hours later, a team of rangers, including the local sheriff, headed back into the forest. They didn't believe me at first. I could see it in their eyes. They thought I had lost my mind. But I was determined to prove what I had seen. The proof was there, buried in the chaos left behind. The search party returned at dusk, exhausted and shaken. They found signs of the struggle, but no body. Nothing to validate the horror I had witnessed. As they debriefed, I felt my heart sink. How could they not see? How could they ignore what was right in front of them? Days turned into weeks, but the creature remained elusive. I was determined to find it, to prove to everyone I was right. I studied the forest, looking for signs, piecing together what I could. Lila and I grew close during this time. She understood the fear and confusion, and we became a team. Then one night, while we were out in the field, we caught a break. The growling returned, echoing through the trees, and this time we were prepared. Armed with flashlights and walkie-talkies, we made our way toward the sound. I could feel the adrenaline coursing through my veins, the excitement of finally confronting the creature that had haunted my every waking moment. As we approached the source, the air thickened with tension. Suddenly the creature emerged from the shadows, its massive form illuminated by our lights. I felt a chill run down my spine, not from fear, but from realization. It was like looking at a reflection of myself a distorted version. It charged, but instead of fleeing, I stood my ground. The fear that had once consumed me was replaced by something else. I saw not just a monster, but a being that was fighting to survive, much like I had once been. With a sudden burst of clarity, I understood it wasn't evil. It was a part of the forest. My past echoed in its movements, a reflection of my own struggles. It wasn't a beast, but a guardian lost to its own rage. The moment was fleeting, gone in the blink of an eye. I stepped aside, allowing it to pass. It paused, and I could feel the weight of its gaze upon me. Then, as quickly as it had come, it melted back into the shadows. Lila looked at me, confusion etched across her face. I felt a sense of peace wash over me. The creature didn't need to die. It needed to be understood. As we left the forest, I realized I had changed in that moment. I didn't need to prove anything to anyone anymore. We headed back to the ranger station and I shared my findings. This time they listened. They could see the conviction in my eyes. The creature wasn't just a figment of my imagination or a story to scare tourists. It was real, and its presence was vital to the balance of the forest. 
Weeks passed, and the story began to spread through the ranger community. The creature, a guardian of the wild, was now a part of our lives. It became a symbol of resilience and a reminder of the importance of understanding the world around us. I had transformed my fear into something powerful, something that could help others see the beauty in the wilderness. In the end, I found my place within the forest, a guardian in my own right. The creature remained a constant in the backdrop of my life, serving as a reminder of what it meant to face your fears and embrace the unknown. The forest was no longer a place of escape, but a home where I belonged. And so the forest thrived, the creature roamed, and I continued my work as a ranger, embracing the wild and all its mysteries, forever changed by the encounter that had once threatened to consume me. It's funny how quiet your life can get when you're out in the woods for months on end, only to be shattered by one wrong call. That's what I told myself as I stood there, boots sinking into the wet mud of a place I had no business being. In retrospect, I should have known better. Should have known that no call on a dead-end dirt road ever ends with a smile and a pat on the back. It was 1996, in the middle of nowhere Washington State. My name's Evan Krause, and I've been a ranger for the better part of a decade. Good job, honestly. Lots of time alone out in nature, no boss breathing down your neck. That was until the day dispatch sent me down a forgotten trail near Skookum Meadows. Something about missing campers. I hate that term, you know? Missing. It's just the polite way of saying, we're not sure what's left of them. The thing is, these woods are old. They have a reputation, passed down through folks who've lived near the fringes for far too long. You'd get stories from people, strange sightings, animals that don't quite fit, but that's just talk, right? Besides, I'm a ranger. I deal in facts, not folklore. That morning, the sky looked like it might drop a bucket or two of rain on me, but I figured it was nothing I hadn't dealt with before. My truck rumbled down a road so narrow that the branches scraped the sides like skeletal fingers. After parking at the base of the trail, I radioed in that I was starting my search. Alone. No backup, no extra gear. And sure, maybe I didn't bring a gun because nothing really happens out here, right? Besides, who needs it? The job's dangerous, but not that kind of dangerous. That's what I told myself. After an hour of hiking deeper into the forest, the trees seemed to crowd in closer, as if the woods themselves were alive and ready to swallow me whole. I stopped to take a piss by an old moss-covered log when I first smelled it. The unmistakable stench of rot, like roadkill left too long in the sun. But there wasn't anything around me, just thick woods. Still... That smell clung to the air like it was trapped in the trees themselves. The further I walked, the worse it got. Then I found the first sign that something wasn't right. Campfire remnants, charred wood. But no tents, no bags, nothing. Just ashes, scattered like someone had stomped out the fire in a hurry. That's when I started noticing the footprints. Human, but not right. Too large, and the spacing between them suggested a limp. Or maybe something heavier. Maybe a prank, I thought. But deep down, I knew better. I knelt to get a closer look at the tracks. And that's when I heard it. A wet, crunching sound, not too far ahead. I didn't want to admit it, but my heart was pounding. I'm not the type to scare easy. But there's something primal that sets in when you hear a noise like that. Out there where no one's supposed to be. I didn't have much of a choice but to follow. Stepping lightly, I moved toward the noise, gripping my flashlight like it was a weapon. After what felt like an eternity, I found the source, a clearing, and in the middle of it, a mass that used to be a person, torn apart like a deer shredded by coyotes. Only this wasn't animals, no claw marks, no bite marks, just ripped limbs and open flesh, scattered like a butcher's floor. The face was gone, chewed beyond recognition, but from the ripped-up clothes, I guessed it was one of the campers. Then I saw the real problem. What had done this was still there, squatting low by the tree line, its back to me. It looked almost human, but hunched over, too large, and with skin that stretched tight over bones in ways that didn't make sense. The smell hit me again, stronger now, 
like meat left in the sun for days. I don't know what possessed me to stay still, but I froze. The thing was gnawing on something, maybe part of the body I couldn't tell. My breath caught in my throat, and I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't any animal I'd ever seen. Suddenly, it stopped chewing. The crunching sound halted and there was silence. It turned its head slightly, not all the way, just enough for me to see that it wasn't right. Its neck didn't move the way it should have, and the part of its face I could see was more skeletal than anything else, like it had been stripped down to the bone. I backed up slowly, trying not to step on any twigs or leaves. My body was screaming to run, but my brain kept reminding me that running was how you got killed. That thing was still crouched, still gnawing, but I knew the second it turned around, it would be over for me. I needed to get back to my truck. Now. I stepped back once, twice, and then there it was, a snap of a twig under my boot. It's the kind of sound you hear in movies, the kind that makes everyone scream at the screen. But this was real. The thing straightened up, towering over the remains, and turned its head fully toward me. Its eyes, or what was left of them, weren't looking. They were just there, hollow, blackened, as if they'd rotted out long ago. I didn't wait to see what it would do. I bolted, sprinting back down the path, lungs burning, heart slamming in my chest. The sound behind me told me it was coming, heavy, lumbering steps too fast for something that size. I didn't dare look back. There's some survival instinct in all of us, some part of our brains that tells us not to do the stupid thing, like glance over your shoulder at the monster that's chasing you. So I ran. The forest blurred past me as I cut through the brush, ignoring the path, just trying to get away. I could hear it gaining, the sound of its movements closer, almost upon me. The thought hit me. What if it wasn't hunting? What if it was just toying with me? Some kind of sick game. Suddenly the ground fell out from beneath me. My foot caught on something and I went down, face first into the dirt. I barely managed to get back up when it hit me. A blow, hard and fast, knocking the wind out of me. The thing had slammed into me like a truck. I rolled, gasping for air, and finally saw it up close. Its skin was translucent in some places, and what looked like muscle fibers were stretched across its ribs, exposed. It was half-rotted, like a corpse that had clawed its way out of the ground but kept on moving. It didn't roar, didn't snarl, just stood there staring at me, as if deciding what to do next. I scrambled for something, anything, to use as a weapon, but all I could feel was the slick mud beneath my hands. The thing lunged. I rolled to the side, narrowly avoiding its grasp, and crawled backward as fast as I could, my back hitting a tree. Then I heard it. Another sound. This one human. A shout, maybe. Something I hadn't expected. In the distance, I saw a figure rushing toward me. Another ranger. Nate. He had a rifle and he was yelling something, but all I could focus on was the gun. He fired. The shot echoed through the trees and the thing jerked, stumbling backward. Another shot. This time it went down, twitching, spasming like some giant insect. We didn't wait to see if it would get up. Nate grabbed my arm and yanked me to my feet. We bolted toward the trucks, the forest echoing with silence behind us. We didn't stop until we were both locked inside the vehicle, breathing hard, staring out at the trees waiting for something to follow us. But nothing did. We sat there in the truck, windows rolled up, rain pattering against the roof. Neither of us said a word. Eventually, Nate broke the silence. He asked if I'd ever seen anything like that before. I shook my head. We didn't report it. We couldn't. Who would believe it? A thing like that, half-rotten, human but not walking around the forest eating people? No one would. But that wasn't what mattered. What mattered was the fact that it was still out there. Not moving, sure, but not gone either. And we didn't bury it. We didn't burn it. We left it there in the woods because sometimes the things you find out here don't leave. And I'll tell you this much, I'm never going back to Skookum Meadows. Not again. In 2001, I was stationed in White River National Forest, Colorado, a place I've worked in for the last few years. My name is Tanner Ward, 
but my friends joke around calling me Mountain Goat for my ability to traverse rough terrains without slipping. Not exactly the most glamorous nickname, but when you're constantly surrounded by bears, wolves, and mountain lions, being compared to something agile and resourceful isn't the worst thing. I've always liked my job. Well, until that summer. The summer began like most others, campers, hikers, and the occasional group of college kids who think they can handle the wilderness with nothing but a six-pack and a map. I was already tired from a rough week of guiding a group of inexperienced teenagers out of the woods when an emergency call came in on a Thursday afternoon. Two backpackers, Tyler and Marcus, were reported missing. They hadn't returned to their car at the trailhead after three days, and there had been no communication from them. Not unusual. People go missing all the time, and they usually turn up sunburned, dehydrated, and embarrassed. The dispatch team figured it would be the same here, but the thing that caught my attention was the report mentioning strange animal sounds in the area. That's why they wanted someone with experience. I got saddled with a junior ranger, Lucas, who was on his second month. Lucas had the cocky swagger of someone who thought the worst thing in the woods was a bear. Good kid, but naive. The trail we took to search for Tyler and Marcus wasn't a difficult one, well-worn and popular with backpackers. It led deep into the forest, down toward a riverbed before looping back toward higher ground. I was expecting to find them camping off trail, maybe stuck somewhere or hurt. Lucas and I trekked for hours, our radios crackling with static, which was typical for the remote terrain. The trees, thick with pines, closed in around us, the familiar weight of the forest settling on our shoulders. Around dusk, we came across the first real sign of trouble, a torn-up campsite. The tents were shredded, and there was a cooking pot, still half full of burnt beans, tipped over next to the extinguished campfire. There was no sign of the men themselves. Lucas raised an eyebrow, gesturing to the mess. Bear? I shook my head. Bears don't just wreck a camp without leaving tracks or digging through food. No claw marks on the trees, no fur left behind. I squatted near the remains of a sleeping bag. The fabric looked torn, but the kind of tear that didn't come from claws. More like it had been ripped apart by something with brute strength. Not great. I could feel Lucas tense up next to me. What do you think did this? I didn't answer, and that silence was enough to spook him. We kept moving, the evening shadows stretching between the trees, casting strange shapes on the ground. I heard something up ahead, just the faintest shuffle of leaves like something moving lightly through the underbrush. Lucas didn't hear it at first, but I did. A rustling that didn't quite fit with the stillness of the forest. I motioned for him to stop. We waited. The sound came again, but this time closer. I didn't like it. I drew my knife. Not because I thought it'd do much, but because it was better than nothing. Lucas gave me a look half concerned, half confused, but he didn't ask questions. Smart move. The noise stopped, leaving us in silence once again. We followed the riverbank for a while until we came to a spot where the ground was damp and soft, perfect for footprints. There were several human ones heading toward the water, but something else too, something bigger. The prints were wide, larger than a human's foot, but I couldn't make out the exact shape in the fading light. It wasn't any animal I was familiar with. Lucas bent down, running his hand over the tracks. What the hell is that? I didn't answer him. Truth was, I didn't know. We kept moving, though every step felt heavier, the weight of the situation pressing down on us. The air grew thicker, more oppressive, as we pushed through the thick underbrush. I'm not a superstitious guy, but there was something wrong with this part of the forest. It felt wrong, like we weren't supposed to be there. I didn't say anything to Lucas, but I could tell by the way he kept glancing around that he felt it too. It wasn't long before we found the bodies. Tyler and Marcus, or what was left of them, were sprawled near a clearing. They were torn apart, and I mean that literally. Their limbs were scattered, ripped from their torsos, and their faces were almost unrecognizable. I've seen animal attacks before. I've seen the aftermath of a bear or a mountain lion going to town on a person. But this wasn't like that. This was savage, but not in the way a wild animal kills to eat. This was intentional. Lucas turned pale, and for a second, I thought he might vomit. He muttered something under his breath about leaving, but I ignored him. My focus was on something else, 
on the tracks leading away from the bodies. Whatever did this had walked away on two legs. I took out my radio to call it in, but there was only static. Of course, because why would anything work when you need it the most? I told Lucas we had to go, and that's when we heard it. Something moving through the trees. Slow, deliberate, and coming closer. It was the same sound I'd heard earlier, but louder now. Heavier. Like whatever it was, it didn't care that we knew it was there. Lucas started backing up, and for the first time, I saw real fear in his eyes. Not the kind of fear you get when a bear shows up, but the kind that sinks into your bones because you know you're dealing with something you don't understand. We didn't wait to see what it was. We ran. Now, I've run from bears before. I've had to scramble up rocks to avoid mountain lions. But this, this was different. It felt like the forest itself was pushing us back, urging us to get the hell out. Every tree looked like it was leaning in, narrowing the path, making it harder to escape. Lucas stumbled over a root, nearly face-planting into the dirt. I grabbed him by the arm and yanked him back up, but I could hear it now, something breathing. Heavy, slow, like the breaths were deliberate, calculated. It wasn't chasing us, but it wasn't far behind either. I risked a glance over my shoulder, and that's when I saw it. I don't even know how to describe the thing. It was tall, easily over seven feet, maybe more. Its skin was pale, stretched over muscle and bone in a way that didn't seem right. I couldn't see a face clearly, just a vague shape, but the way it moved, slow and deliberate, wasn't like any animal I'd ever seen. It had the stance of a man, but the movements of something predatory, like it was stalking us. Lucas saw it too, and that was all it took for him to start panicking. He let out a shout, a panicked yell that echoed through the trees. Big mistake. The thing stopped, its head snapping toward us, and then it moved. Fast. Lucas ran, screaming something about getting out, about dying here, but I barely heard him. My adrenaline kicked in, my focus narrowed. I didn't look back again, didn't want to. All I could do was run, one foot in front of the other, hoping like hell that whatever was behind us wouldn't catch up. The path ahead split, and without thinking, I grabbed Lucas by the arm and pulled him down the left trail. It led deeper into the forest, toward the cliffs near the river. I could hear the thing behind us, crashing through the underbrush like it didn't care who or what was in its way. It was getting closer, I could feel it. And now then I saw the cliff's edge ahead of us, and I knew we were out of options. Lucas was panting hard, stumbling beside me, his eyes wild with fear. I didn't stop. I didn't give him a chance to think. I pushed him toward the cliff. We slid down the rocky slope, dirt and gravel tearing at my hands and knees. I heard Lucas hit the bottom with a grunt, but I didn't check to see if he was okay. I just scrambled to my feet, pulling him up as the thing came to a halt at the top of the cliff, staring down at us. It didn't move. For a moment I thought we were safe, that maybe it wouldn't follow us down the steep incline. But then, with slow, deliberate movements, it began climbing down, its long arms reaching for the rocks like it had done this a hundred times before. Lucas was shaking, his breath coming in short gasps. He wanted to run. I could see it in his eyes, but I grabbed his arm, forcing him to stay still. If we ran now, we wouldn't make it. The thing reached the bottom of the cliff, its eyes, or whatever passed for eyes, locking onto us. It didn't roar or growl, didn't make any sound at all. It just moved toward us, slow, methodical, like it knew we had nowhere left to go. I don't know what came over me. Maybe adrenaline, maybe desperation, but I pulled the flare gun from my pack. I only had one shot, but it was better than nothing. Lucas was too scared to do anything but stare as I raised the flare gun, aiming at the thing's chest. I pulled the trigger. The flare shot out, bright and burning, hitting the creature square in the chest. For a second it staggered back, its body jerking as if in surprise. Then it let out a sound, a deep guttural noise that vibrated through my bones. It wasn't a sound of pain, but of anger. The thing didn't die. It didn't even fall. But it stopped. It looked at me, then at Lucas, and then, without warning, it turned and walked back into the trees. I don't know why it left us. Maybe the flare hurt it. Maybe it didn't see us as worth the effort anymore. But whatever the reason, it was gone, disappearing into the forest as silently as it had appeared. We didn't stick around to find out why. When we finally made it back to the trailhead, I called it in. 
Tyler and Marcus were dead, that much was clear. As for what killed them, I didn't have an explanation. I filed the report, I described the bodies, but I didn't mention the thing we saw. People believe what they want to believe. As for me, I'm still here, still working the same trails, but I stay away from the river now. Some places you just don't go. And whatever that thing was, it's still out there. I've been working as a ranger in the Angeles National Forest for six years, though my journey to this career wasn't exactly planned. It's funny, I used to tell people I'd work in IT forever, sitting in front of a computer and pretending to care about which firewall was best for some startup. After the divorce, I wanted out of everything, out of the city, out of the noise, out of the mess I'd made of my life. The forest seemed like the perfect escape, but I've learned one thing. Solitude isn't always peaceful. Sometimes it feels like you're alone because something doesn't want you to leave. It was 1997. The forest was quieter than usual, almost as if the wildlife had taken a collective day off. The tourists, campers, and even the usual teenagers looking for places to drink were nowhere to be found. My job that day was to check on a group of campers who had set up in a more secluded area, far off the beaten path. I'm not the type to complain about these things, but the whole situation felt off from the moment I stepped out of my truck. I grabbed my radio, stuffed it in my pack, and set off along the trail. It was around a three-mile hike to the camper's site. Normally I'd enjoy the solitude, maybe crack a couple of dark jokes to myself to break the silence, but that day, the silence was oppressive. No birds, no wind, just my boots crunching on the dirt. I reached the campsite a little afternoon, expecting to find the usual. A couple of tents, maybe a fire pit, some hung laundry flapping in the wind. Instead, it was completely deserted. The tents were still there, but no people. That's never a good sign. I walked around, calling out for them. No response. The only thing I found was a pack of cards scattered near one of the tents, as if someone had been playing and just... left. There was no blood, no sign of a struggle, nothing. They were just gone. I'm used to campers wandering off for short hikes, but this felt different. There was no gear missing, no backpacks, no food wrappers strewn about. Everything was as if they'd just stood up and walked away in the middle of whatever they were doing. I radioed it in, asking if anyone had seen the group come back to the main trail or into town. Dispatch said no, and they hadn't received any check-ins from the group. I poked around the area for a while, looking for any signs of where they might have gone. About 50 yards from the campsite, I found something weird. The ground was disturbed, almost as if something heavy had been dragged across it. There were odd tracks in the dirt, nothing I'd seen before. They were wide and deep, but not human, not any animal I recognized. I thought about snapping a picture, but my old film camera was useless in the dim light under the trees. I figured I'd follow the trail for a bit, just to see where it led. That was my first mistake. I followed those tracks deeper into the woods, further than I'd ever ventured in that part of the forest. The trail led me to a part of the forest I wasn't familiar with, it was denser, older. The trees here seemed taller, their branches twisted in ways that looked unnatural. The air was thick with dampness, like I was walking into a place that hadn't been disturbed in a long time. I kept going, and the tracks started getting harder to follow. They twisted and doubled back like whatever I was following knew I was behind it. After an hour or so, I came across something that made my stomach drop. A boot. Just one, half buried in the dirt. I picked it up, and it was covered in dried mud, but I knew it belonged to one of the campers. That wasn't a good sign. Then I heard it. A sound in the distance. It was faint, but it sounded like someone or something moving quickly through the brush. I thought maybe it was the campers, lost, trying to find their way back. But the longer I listened, the more it didn't sound right. The movement was erratic, fast one moment, slow the next. No animal I knew moved like that. I radioed back to base, but all I got was static. Typical. That's when I saw it. Something large, just at the edge of my vision, moving between the trees. I couldn't make out what it was, but it was big. Bigger than any deer or bear I'd ever seen. My instinct told me to backtrack, to head back to the campsite. 
but I couldn't leave without knowing what had happened to those campers. I stayed low and moved as quietly as I could, following the sound. It led me to a small clearing where the trees parted enough for some light to shine through. That's when I saw it. At first I thought it was a downed tree or a pile of rocks, but as I got closer, I realized it was a body. No, several bodies. They were mangled, half buried in the earth, limbs torn apart, bones cracked and splintered. I gagged but kept it together. There were at least three of them, the campers, I assumed. But what had done this? As I stood there staring at the horror in front of me, I heard that same erratic movement again, this time closer. Much closer. I spun around, my heart pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears. And then I saw it. It stepped into the clearing, partially obscured by the trees, but I could make out enough to know it wasn't anything natural. It was tall, at least seven feet, maybe more. Its skin was pale, almost sickly white like it hadn't seen sunlight in years. It moved on two legs, but its gait was wrong, jerky, like it was unused to walking. Its body was humanoid but elongated, too thin in some places, too broad in others. And the smell... It hit me before I even registered the sight. Rotting flesh. Like something that had been dead for days. It didn't make a sound. Just stared at me. Its head cocked to the side like it was curious. My brain kicked into gear and I bolted. Running through the forest is never a good idea, but there wasn't a choice. I didn't care about the tracks or where I was going. I just ran. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the trees, faster than anything that big should have been able to move. I wasn't going to make it. That thing was going to catch me, rip me apart like it had those campers, and no one would ever find me. But then I saw it. A ranger station in the distance. I hadn't even realized I was this close to one. I sprinted for it, my legs burning, lungs on fire. I made it inside, slammed the door shut and locked it. I could hear the thing outside scratching at the walls, its weight pressing against the wooden door. It was testing the place, looking for a way in. I grabbed the radio off the wall, frantically trying to get through to someone, anyone, but all I got was static. The creature slammed against the door, hard enough to splinter the wood. I grabbed a flare gun off the wall. It wasn't much, but it was something. If it came through that door, I'd light it up and hope for the best. I didn't have to wait long. The door gave way, wood exploding inward, and there it was, standing in the doorway. I fired the flare gun, hitting it square in the chest. The thing screeched, a sound so high-pitched it felt like my ears were going to bleed. It stumbled back, the flare burning through its flesh, but it didn't stop. It kept coming, slower now, but still determined. I fired again, but the gun was empty. I was out of options. The thing lunged at me, its claws outstretched, but just as it reached me, something strange happened. It stopped. It froze mid-motion as if something had taken hold of it. Its body twitched violently, and then it collapsed to the floor. I stood there, panting, unable to comprehend what had just happened. The thing was dead, or at least it wasn't moving anymore. I didn't waste time. I ran out of the station and headed back to the main road. I radioed in as soon as I had a signal, and a team was sent out to recover the bodies. They found the campers, or what was left of them. But when they got to the station, the thing I had killed was gone. The official report said it was a bear. I didn't argue. No one would have believed me anyway. The next day, I packed up my things and left the Angeles National Forest for good. Whatever that thing was, I never wanted to see it again. The last thing I wanted was to get involved in something like this. But you know, life doesn't ask for permission before it flips your world upside down. I was just doing my job, nothing more. I was assigned to this remote patch of woods in Mississippi in 2002, checking for illegal hunting. My name's Ronan Sanders, and I've been a park ranger for about seven years now. I got into it for the peace and quiet after getting fired from a string of soul-sucking desk jobs. The way I see it, Dealing with nature is a lot simpler than dealing with people. Trees don't talk back. Bears don't care if you miss a deadline. So when they offered me this gig out in the Sipsy wilderness, I jumped on it. 
Little did I know that place wasn't about to offer the kind of solitude I was hoping for. Now, Sipsy's not exactly the kind of forest people flock to. It's dense. The trees are packed tight like they're trying to keep something hidden. I'd seen all kinds of wildlife out there. Deer, wild boars, the occasional coyote. But that day was different. I was doing my usual rounds when I found something strange. No, scratch that. Something messed up. A campsite. Or at least what was left of one. It looked like it had been abandoned for weeks, if not months. Torn tents, sleeping bags ripped apart, and no signs of the people who once occupied them. It was one of those situations where you get a pit in your stomach, but you tell yourself you're overreacting. Maybe they'd just packed up in a hurry. Maybe a bear got into their supplies. I radioed it in, told the folks at the station that I'd found some abandoned gear, but I didn't think much of it at first. The longer I stayed, though, the more I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. There were no tracks leading away from the campsite, no footprints, no sign of any vehicles or horses that could have taken them out of there, just... nothing. Like they'd been plucked right out of existence. I wasn't armed. Not that I didn't believe in carrying, I do, but I never saw the point of lugging around a rifle unless I knew I'd be in actual danger. And there hadn't been any reports of dangerous animals in the area for a long time. Besides, my old boss had drilled it into me that we weren't supposed to scare off the tourists by looking like we were preparing for a war zone. Joke's on him, I guess. I kept moving, planning to head back to the truck before dark. That's when I found the body. Or what was left of it. It was a few hundred feet from the campsite, hidden in some brush. A man, at least I think it was a man. Hard to tell since whatever got him had pretty much torn him to shreds. And I'm not talking about your usual predator attack, either. This wasn't a bear or a coyote. It was something else. The flesh was mauled, but not in a way that made sense. There were no bite marks, no claw marks, just raw, brutal force like something had taken a sledgehammer to him. I remember laughing. Yeah, not my proudest moment. But it wasn't the kind of laughter that comes from humor. It was the nervous, shaky kind. The kind that says, this can't be happening, this isn't real. Only it was real, and I had no idea what to do. What do you do in a situation like that? There's no handbook for finding a mutilated body in the middle of the woods. I stood there, just staring, until the smell hit me. Then I started gagging, my stomach doing flips like it was auditioning for Cirque du Soleil. I wanted to turn around and go back to the truck. Hell, I wanted to run, but something in me told me to stay. Maybe it was morbid curiosity... Maybe it was some instinct I didn't even know I had, but I found myself moving forward instead of away. That's when I heard it, this low, guttural noise from deeper in the woods. I'm not ashamed to say that's when my legs decided they had their own agenda. I bolted back toward the truck, but I didn't make it far before I heard something, branches breaking like something big was moving through the underbrush. Something big and fast. I've heard deer move through the woods at a full sprint before, and this wasn't that. It wasn't graceful. It wasn't quick. It was loud. Like something too heavy to be moving that fast, crashing through everything in its way. I froze, crouched behind a tree, my heart pounding in my ears. And then I saw it. The thing lumbered out from the trees and into the clearing where the body was. It was about eight feet tall, hunched over its skin this pale, leathery gray, with these long, almost skeletal limbs. Its face, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like someone had tried to stitch together parts of different animals and humans, but had failed miserably. I could see patches of fur in some spots, but in others, the skin was bare, with strange patterns carved into it like scars or burns. It moved with this awkward, jerky motion, sniffing the air like a dog trying to catch a scent. Then it knelt beside the body, and that's when I lost it. I booked it back toward the truck, not caring if it heard me or not. I wasn't about to wait around to see what that thing was planning to do next. By the time I made it back to the station, I was in full-blown panic mode. I didn't care if I looked crazy. I reported the body, the campsite, everything. They sent out a search team the next day, but by the time they got there, the body was gone. Of course it was. They found some of the gear I'd mentioned, but nothing else. No signs of the people, no tracks, no remains. 
I don't know if that thing took the body or if it had just decided to move on after I left, but whatever it was, it left nothing behind. I didn't bother telling them about the creature. I knew how that conversation would go. I'd be written up, labeled a crackpot, and probably reassigned to some cushy office job far away from the woods. So I kept my mouth shut. But I didn't stop thinking about it. You don't just walk away from something like that and go back to your regular life. I started avoiding that part of the woods altogether, made excuses to my supervisors, told them I was focusing on other areas, and for a while that worked, but it didn't last. A few weeks later, another body turned up. This time, one of the hunters found it. Same kind of mutilation, same brutal force. The thing was still out there, and now it was getting bold. People were starting to notice the disappearances, the odd behavior of the animals in the area. The higher-ups didn't want to admit it, but they knew something was wrong. There were whispers around the station, rumors about an old legend tied to the area. Something about a creature the locals had talked about for centuries. Most of it sounded like the usual folklore, but after what I'd seen, I wasn't in the mood to dismiss anything. A few days later, I was back out on patrol. I hadn't planned to go near the area where I found the first body but I got called in to investigate another campsite that had been found wrecked. I knew what I'd find before I even got there. The destruction was the same, ripped tents, scattered belongings, no people in sight. And then I heard it again, that same crashing sound, that same awful noise. I didn't run this time. I stood my ground, gripping the only weapon I had, a rusted machete I'd found on a previous patrol. Not much, but better than nothing. The thing came out of the woods, moving faster this time, it saw me, and for a split second, we locked eyes. There was this strange intelligence in the way it looked at me, like it was sizing me up. It charged. I swung the machete, but I might as well have been swatting at a fly. It hit me like a freight train sending me sprawling to the ground. My head slammed against a rock, and everything went blurry. I could feel its hot breath on me, hear its heavy, ragged breathing as it loomed over me. But then, just as suddenly as it attacked, it stopped. It let out this horrible low sound, and for the first time, I saw fear in its movements. Something spooked it, something in the distance. It retreated into the woods, disappearing into the underbrush, just as the world around me faded to black. I woke up in the hospital the next day. They told me I'd been found by a couple of hikers, unconscious and bleeding, but alive. No one believed my story about the creature. Why would they? I didn't have proof, just a cracked skull and some bruises to show for it. I don't know what that thing was or why it spared me when it had the chance to finish me off. Maybe it was a warning. Maybe it wasn't interested in me, just the ones who had been foolish enough to camp in its territory. They can call me crazy all they want, but I know it's still out there, somewhere in those woods, waiting for its next. There I go again. Sounding like one of those guys who wears tinfoil hats and shouts about conspiracies. But you can believe whatever you want. There's a fine line between a good day in the field and a day that goes to hell. I'd had plenty of the first kind. Enough to think maybe I was overdue for the latter. The year was 2007, a year after my third divorce finalized. You'd think after three rounds you'd get a little smarter about it, but no, you just get more tired. Anyway, I'd been working as a park ranger up in the Adirondacks, upstate New York, for a little over a decade at that point. The job had a simple rhythm, something I liked. A little solitude, a little paperwork, and more than enough fresh air to keep your lungs happy. But then you get a call like the one I got that morning. It was from Gary, another ranger, asking me to head over to a section of the park that didn't see many visitors. Some of the more dedicated hikers tried it, but most were scared off by the wild terrain and the lack of cell reception. We're talking dense forest, overgrown paths, cliffs that seemed to come out of nowhere. The works. The problem was that someone had gone missing out there. It wasn't uncommon. People get cocky, lose track of where they are, and we have to haul them back out. Gary told me a couple had checked in at the visitor station but never made it to their car. Just great. I grabbed my gear and headed out, mentally preparing for a long afternoon of trekking and possibly dealing with some city couple who thought they could handle nature because they watched a few survival shows. 
I was wrong, of course. Nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to stumble into. About an hour into the trail, things started to feel off. I couldn't shake this sense that I wasn't alone. Now, I don't mean the usual stuff, animals rustling in the underbrush or the wind playing tricks on you. No, this was something more deliberate, almost like I was being tracked, if that makes any sense. Now I've had my fair share of moments where the woods get under your skin. Dark humor helps with that. But this time, no punchline, no relief. Just the unshakable sensation of eyes on my back. I tried shaking it off, but as I moved deeper I found something. A backpack, partially buried under a mound of leaves, like someone had tried to hide it. Inside were clothes, two water bottles, and a map of the park. All of it soaked, dirty. The kind of dirty that says it's been out here longer than a night. And there was blood. Not a lot, but enough to make me pause. I radioed Gary, told him I'd found some gear that likely belonged to the missing couple. He said he was an hour away, but would come out to meet me. I wasn't planning on waiting. Not with how weird everything felt. About another half mile in, I found something worse. The body of a man, lying awkwardly against a tree, like he'd been dropped there. His face... Well, let's just say it didn't look like an animal had gotten to him. More like something had torn at him, but not for food. Just for the hell of it. I crouched next to him, trying to get a better look at the injuries, to make sense of what had happened. But there wasn't much left to figure out. His clothes were shredded, but his pack was still on him, untouched. I don't know what struck me harder, the fact that this guy hadn't been robbed, or the fact that his face looked like it had been clawed by something much larger than a wolf. Wolves. That's what I told myself at first, though I knew better. We don't get wolves this far east. Sure, the occasional coyote, but this... This wasn't that. It wasn't long before I heard the rustling in the brush. Not the kind of rustling that says it's a deer or something you can laugh off. This was deliberate. Heavy. Whoever or whatever was moving toward me wasn't worried about being heard. That's when I realized I'd forgotten my gun... I hadn't even thought to pack it since it was just supposed to be another routine sweep. Of course, it was now that I remembered one of the first rules of park service. Assume every day is the worst one. I grabbed my radio about to call for backup, when I saw something move between the trees. It was fast, darting in and out of my line of sight. But what I did catch? Well, let's just say it was too big for a person. Way too big. My heart was in my throat, but I stayed low creeping toward a cluster of rocks for cover. I still had the radio in my hand, but it didn't feel like it was going to do me much good. The thing out there, it wasn't coming for conversation. It was hunting. I heard it again, that heavy footfall. And then I saw it. Fully this time. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. The size of a grizzly, but not one. Its fur was patchy, coarse, and its limbs were long, unnaturally so with claws that made the guy by the tree suddenly make sense. But the worst part? Its face. The thing's face was twisted, like some kind of nightmare blend between a bear and a wild dog, but meaner. There was an intelligence in the way it moved, in the way it stopped when it caught sight of me. I've dealt with dangerous animals before, and the usual strategy is to make yourself look bigger, scarier than they are. But this thing? You couldn't outscare something like that, I don't think it even had the concept of fear. It stared at me for what felt like an eternity, its breath heavy, its head cocked as if it was deciding whether I was worth the effort. And then it took a step forward. I didn't wait to find out what its next move would be. I took off, sprinting through the trees, the terrain uneven beneath my boots. Branches whipped my face, rocks slid underfoot, but I didn't dare slow down. I could hear it behind me, its claws tearing into the ground with every step. I've never been much of a runner, but adrenaline does wonders when something like that is chasing you. I managed to reach a small clearing, one that led to the edge of a ravine. For a split second I thought about jumping, but then I saw a narrow path to my left that followed the cliff's edge. I took it, hoping the creature wouldn't be able to follow. No such luck. It was right on me, closer now, and I could feel its breath on my neck. That's when I saw it. An old ranger cabin barely visible through the trees. It was my only chance. I made a break for it, praying the door wasn't locked. When I reached it, I yanked it open and slammed it behind me. 
I could hear the creature outside pacing, scratching at the wood. But the door held. For now. The cabin wasn't much, just a single room with a cot, a wood stove, and a radio that probably hadn't worked in decades. I grabbed the heaviest thing I could find, a rusted fire poker, and stood by the door, waiting for the inevitable. The scratching stopped. I held my breath, listening. Nothing. Had it given up? I edged toward the window, peering out. And that's when I saw it. The creature was gone. But standing in its place, right at the tree line, was a man. Or at least something that looked like one. His clothes were tattered, hanging off his frame, and he was staring right at the cabin. At me. There was something wrong with his face, like it didn't quite fit. His skin was stretched too tight, his mouth too wide, his teeth... I don't even want to describe them. He didn't move, just stood there watching. I backed away from the window, my hands shaking. There was no way out, no way past him. The door rattled. The man was at it now, his fingers wrapping around the edges, pulling at the wood. I could hear the splintering, the groaning of the hinges. I braced myself, the fire poker raised. But the door never gave. Instead, there was a sudden thud, then another, heavy, like something large slamming into the side of the cabin. And then... Silence. I waited, still holding the poker, my breath shallow. Whatever was out there wasn't done yet. It was waiting. The last thing I remember before everything went dark was the sound of the radio crackling back to life. Gary's voice coming through, panicked, asking where the hell I was. By the time they found me the next morning, the door was still intact, but the cabin looked like it had been hit by a freight train. Gary said they found the couple, what was left of them, not far from where I'd last radioed in. But the thing that killed them? No one could explain it. The bodies didn't go anywhere, though. They were still there. The proof was enough. They asked me if I'd go back to work, but after that day, let's just say I've had enough of the woods. It was 1997 when I first set foot in the sprawling expanse of Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. My name's Nathaniel Nate Holloway, and I'd just landed a job as a park ranger, a dream I'd chased since I was a kid flipping through National Geographic magazines. The park's rolling hills and dense forests were a far cry from the concrete maze of Baltimore where I grew up, and I relished every moment of it. On my days off, I'd often hike the lesser-known trails, partly for solitude and partly because I fancied myself an amateur botanist. My colleagues joked that I could identify a tree faster than they could finish a cup of coffee. They weren't wrong. I'd always had a knack for noticing the small details. Call it a perk or a quirk, but it made me good at my job. One crisp autumn morning, I was assigned to check out a section of the park that had been closed off due to some unexplained animal disturbances. Livestock from neighboring farms had gone missing, and a few campers reported eerie sounds that didn't match any known wildlife. The higher-ups thought it might be a rogue bear, or worse, poachers. I was teamed up with Marcus, a seasoned ranger with a dry wit and a penchant for sunflower seeds. Ready for a walk in the woods, Nate? Marcus said, cracking a seed between his teeth. Always. Just hope the wildlife behaves itself today, I replied. Well, if it doesn't, at least you can charm it with your tree facts, he quipped. We set out around 8 a.m., the sun just starting to filter through the canopy. The trail we followed was overgrown, seldom used by tourists. As we ventured deeper, the forest seemed to swallow us, the sounds of chirping birds giving way to an unsettling silence. You notice how quiet it is? I asked. Maybe the birds are giving us the silent treatment? Did you forget their birthdays? Marcus joked. I chuckled, but the absence of sound gnawed at me. An hour in, we came across the first oddity. A deer carcass, or what was left of it. The body was mutilated beyond recognition, organs missing, bones exposed. That's not normal, Marcus said, his tone shifting to seriousness. Could be a bear, but I've never seen one do this, I replied, crouching down to examine the remains. There were no drag marks, no signs of a struggle. Or maybe a mountain lion? Possibly, but they're rare around these parts. 
We documented the site, took some photos, and decided to press on. About half a mile later, the trees began to change. The oaks and maples gave way to twisted, gnarled trunks that looked ancient. The air grew thick, tinged with a metallic scent. Feels like we've stepped into a different world, Marcus remarked. An older one, I said, touching the rough bark of a tree that seemed as old as time. Just then, a sound echoed, a low, haunting whistle that sent a chill down my spine. Did you hear that? I whispered. Probably the wind, Marcus said, though his eyes betrayed his uncertainty. Since when does the wind sound like a funeral tune? We pressed on, each step heavier than the last. The trail disappeared entirely and the underbrush grew dense. We hacked our way through, the silence only broken by that intermittent whistle. Suddenly, we stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood a dilapidated cabin that wasn't on any of our maps. Looks like we found the local real estate hotspot, Marcus said, attempting to lighten the mood. Yeah, a real fixer-upper, I replied. We approached cautiously. The cabin's windows were shattered, the door hanging off its hinges. Inside, we found signs of recent activity, discarded food cans, a smoldering fire pit. Someone's been squatting here, Marcus observed. Or something, I said, pointing to the scratch marks on the walls. They were deep, parallel grooves that didn't match any tool or animal I knew. That's not exactly a welcoming decoration, he noted. A sudden thud came from the back room. We both drew our radios, standard issue, but hardly a defense. Probably just a raccoon, Marcus whispered. With our luck, it's a real estate agent, I joked, trying to mask my unease. We edged toward the sound. Pushing open the door, we found the room empty save for a large hole in the floorboards. Peering down, we realized it led to an underground tunnel. Well, that's not on the brochure, Marcus said. I didn't know basements were trending in forest architecture. We decided to radio back for support. Base, this is Ranger Holloway. We've discovered an uncharted cabin and possible underground structure at coordinates. Static swallowed my words. That's odd, I said, tapping the radio. Let me try mine, Marcus offered. Same result. Looks like we're on our own, he sighed. Story of my life. We had a choice. Head back and report in person or investigate further. The smart move was to leave, but curiosity got the better of us. Five minutes, then we're out, I suggested. Fine, but if we get lost, I'm blaming you, Marcus replied. We descended carefully into the hole, using our flashlights to illuminate the narrow passage. The walls were lined with strange symbols, etched deeply into the stone. Any idea what these mean? Marcus asked. Not a clue. Maybe ancient graffiti artists? The tunnel opened up into a cavern. The air was thick, damp, and carried a foul odor. This is starting to feel like a bad idea, Marcus muttered. Starting to... I thought that ship sailed when we skipped breakfast. At the far end of the cavern, we saw something that made us freeze. A pile of bones, both animal and unmistakably human. Well, that's... Concerning, I managed to say. Looks like we've found where the missing livestock and people ended up. Before we could react further, a shadow moved across the wall. Something was in here with us. Did you see that? Marcus whispered. Yep, and I'm pretty sure it's not the welcoming committee. We backed toward the tunnel entrance when a figure emerged from the darkness. It stood on two legs like a human but was covered in coarse fur. Its face resembled that of a hyena, jaws elongated with sharp teeth gleaming. That's not in any field guide I've read, I said. Time to go, Marcus yelled. We turned to run, but the creature was fast, too fast. It let out a sound, a mix between a cackle and a roar, that echoed painfully in the confined space. Split up, I shouted. Are you insane? Just do it! I darted to the left, hoping to draw it away. Marcus hesitated, but then bolted to the right. The creature chased after me, its footsteps heavy and relentless. I scrambled over rocks and ducked under low ceilings, my flashlight flickering. I could hear its breathing behind me, raspy and eager. Why do I always get the fun jobs? I mumbled. I spotted a narrow crevice ahead and squeezed through. The creature clawed at the entrance, unable to fit. Ha! Guess you skipped yoga class, I taunted. I didn't have long. 
I needed to find a way out and regroup with Marcus. Crawling through the tight space, I emerged into another tunnel. This one had a faint light at the end. Please be an exit, I whispered. As I approached, the smell hit me. Fresh air mixed with the scent of pine. Relief washed over me until I heard Marcus scream. Without thinking, I rushed back. Navigating the labyrinth of tunnels, I followed the echoes of his voice. I found him in a chamber, cornered by not one but two of the creatures. Marcus! I shouted. He looked at me, eyes wide. Nate, get out of here! Not without you! I searched frantically for anything to use as a weapon. Spotting a loose stalactite, I grabbed it and hurled it at one of the creatures. It struck its shoulder, causing it to snarl and turn toward me. Hey, overgrown Fido, fetch! I yelled. The creature charged. I dodged, causing it to crash into the wall. Marcus took the opportunity to throw a rock at the other one, hitting it square in the face. Nice arm, I called out. Played a little baseball in college, he replied. We didn't waste any more time. Running together, we headed for what we hoped was the way out. The tunnels seemed to twist and turn, each passage looking the same. Any idea where we're going? Marcus asked. Just following the left-hand rule, I said. What's that? Always take the left path. Supposed to lead you out of mazes. Let's hope it works for caves, too. The creatures were behind us, their snarls echoing. One of them let out that eerie cackling sound again. Sounds like they're laughing at us, Marcus noted. Maybe they heard your jokes. Harsh, even now. We reached a fork. Without hesitation, we took the left path. The ground began to slope upward, and a breeze touched our faces. We're close, I exclaimed. Bursting out of an opening, we found ourselves halfway up a rocky hillside. The forest stretched out below, the afternoon sun casting long shadows. Now what? Marcus panted. Head downhill. Maybe we can lose them in the trees. We scrambled down the slope, loose rocks tumbling with each step. Behind us, the creatures emerged from the cave, unfazed by the terrain. These guys just don't give up, Marcus said. Must be fans of ours. Reaching the tree line, we weaved between the trunks, trying to put as much distance as possible. I could hear the creatures crashing through the underbrush. Got any more of those baseball skills? I asked, fresh out of rocks. An idea struck me. The old ranger station isn't far from here. We might find supplies, or at least a place to barricade ourselves. Lead the way! We altered our course, heading east. The forest was dense here, but familiarity guided me. The station came into view, a small wooden structure that had been abandoned years ago. We burst inside, slamming the door behind us. I shoved a heavy cabinet against it while Marcus checked the windows. Windows have bars. Guess they were worried about bears, he said. Or something worse. Searching the room, we found a flare gun, some old lanterns, and a rusted fire axe. Not exactly an arsenal, but it'll have to do, I said. Better than nothing. The creatures reached the cabin, scratching and pounding on the door. Persistent, aren't they? Marcus remarked. I've had exes less clingy. One of them began to ram the door repeatedly. The wood started to splinter. Time for a plan B, I suggested. Which is... Distraction. I'll shoot a flare through the back window to draw them away. When they chase it, we make a run for the main station. Risky, but I like it. I loaded the flare gun and aimed it out the rear window, firing into the sky. The bright light arced and descended into the forest, hissing. The pounding stopped. Did it work? Marcus whispered. A moment of silence. Then a crash. The creatures were breaking through the front door. Guess they didn't fall for it, I said. Plan C? Fight. One creature burst through, its eyes locked onto us. Marcus swung the fire axe, grazing its arm. It snarled and lunged at him. I grabbed a lantern and threw it at the second one entering behind. The glass shattered, oil splattering and igniting upon contact with the creature's fur. Looks like you're fired, I shouted. The flaming creature thrashed wildly, crashing into its companion. They both stumbled back outside, the fire spreading to dry leaves around the cabin. Great, now the forest is on fire, Marcus noted. At least it might slow them down. We seized the moment and dashed out the back door. Smoke began to fill the air as the flames grew. Think Smokey the bear's gonna be upset? I quipped. 
Let's survive first, worry about the lecture later. We raced toward the main station, our lungs burning from exertion and smoke. Behind us, the fire roared, but the creatures were no longer in sight. Bursting into the main station, we startled Ellie, the dispatcher. What happened to you two? she exclaimed. No time to explain fully, I said between breaths. There are... things out there. We need to alert the authorities. Marcus collapsed into a chair, and maybe a cold drink wouldn't hurt. We relayed our story to the bewildered staff. Calls were made, and soon law enforcement and additional rangers were dispatched to the area. Do you think they'll find them? Ellie asked quietly. I hope so. Whatever they are, they're dangerous, I replied. Days later, search teams recovered evidence from the cavern. Bones, personal effects of missing persons, and those strange symbols etched into the walls. However, no creatures were found. Official reports labeled it a case of wild animal attacks, possibly a previously unknown bear species. Marcus and I knew that wasn't the case, but there was little more we could do. Well, Nate, looks like we've added monster hunters to our resumes, Marcus said as we stood at the edge of the burned section of forest. Not exactly the career progression I had in mind. Could be worse. We could be the ones on milk cartons. True. Always got a look on the bright side. As we turned to head back, Marcus chuckled. You know, if this whole ranger thing doesn't work out, we could always go into stand-up comedy. With your jokes... We'd be chased off the stage faster than we were chased by those creatures. Hey, at least the audience wouldn't be trying to eat us. Can't argue with that. Life at the park slowly returned to normal, or as normal as it could be after what we'd experienced. The area around the cavern remained off-limits, a quiet reminder of the unknown lurking just beyond the safety of the well-trodden paths. One afternoon, a delivery arrived for me at the station, a package with no return address. Inside was an old book filled with sketches resembling the symbols we'd seen and illustrations of creatures similar to what we encountered. Looks like we've got some light reading, Marcus said over my shoulder. Or a new mystery to solve. Think we're up for it? I closed the book thoughtfully. Well, we did survive round one. Besides, someone has to keep an eye on things around here. Good thing we didn't skip career day back in school. Yeah. Who knew Ranger came with so many surprises? As we filed the book away, ready to tackle whatever came next, I couldn't help but appreciate the irony. I'd left the city seeking peace and ended up finding mysteries deeper than any urban jungle could offer. Ready for another day in paradise? I asked. Always. After all, someone's got to make sure you don't get lost again. Me get lost? I think your sense of direction is still back in that cavern. Touché. We headed out on our patrol, the vast wilderness stretching before us. The sun peeked through the trees, and for a moment, everything seemed perfectly ordinary. By the way, you still owe me that breakfast we skipped, Marcus said. Fine, but if the bacon tries to bite back, I'm out. Deal. And with that, we ventured back into the woods, ever vigilant, ever curious, and perhaps just a bit wiser about the secrets the forest chose to keep. I've been doing this job long enough that nothing really surprises me anymore. Not after what happened in 2011 in Kentucky's Daniel Boone National Forest. My name's Lane Brooks, and I've been working as a park ranger for almost two decades. Yeah, I know. You're probably picturing me in some overly starched uniform, a wide-brimmed hat, clipboard in hand, yelling at kids for littering. It's not that kind of job, though. My work is mostly checking the trails, making sure tourists don't fall off cliffs, and once in a while, finding a lost hiker or a kid who wandered too far from the campsite. But that day, everything was different. Daniel Boone National Forest is the kind of place where you can walk for days and not see a soul. Just miles and miles of thick woods, towering limestone cliffs, and deep gorges. It's breathtaking, sure, but it's also dangerous if you don't know where you're going. That particular morning... I was just finishing my second cup of bad coffee, staring at the computer, running through the reports from the previous night. Nothing unusual, until I got a call from the local sheriff's department. Apparently a couple of hikers hadn't returned from a three-day trek. They were supposed to meet some friends at the trailhead but never showed. 
I know what you're thinking. Lost hikers. Happens all the time, right? Usually they just take a wrong turn, get scared, and we find them within a few hours. But this one felt off from the start. Something in the sheriff's voice had attention to it. Like he wasn't just checking a box, but genuinely worried. So I grabbed my pack, radioed my partner Jim, and headed out to the last known location. It was a remote trail, the kind people don't use often. Honestly, you'd have to know the forest pretty damn well to even find it. The deeper we hiked, the quieter it got. The kind of quiet where you notice every crunch under your boots, every twig snapping. Now Jim's the kind of guy who always tries to break the tension with jokes. He looked up at the sky and said, Hey, if we get eaten by Bigfoot out here, I'm blaming you for bringing me along. I chuckled, but my mind was already racing through the possibilities. It wasn't Bigfoot I was worried about. We reached a ridge about four hours in, overlooking a dense ravine. Jim was yammering on about something, probably another one of his conspiracy theories, but I wasn't listening. My eyes were fixed on a dark shape just at the tree line, near the bottom of the ravine. It was something big, and I'm not talking a deer or a bear, something much bigger. We scrambled down, and as we got closer, the smell hit us first. If you've never smelled death before, count yourself lucky. It's thick, cloying, something that sticks to the back of your throat and lingers. There, half buried under a pile of leaves, was the body of one of the hikers, or at least what was left of him. He looked like he had been torn apart, limbs broken, chest ripped open like some kind of savage animal had gotten to him. But here's the thing. No animal does that. Not here, not anywhere. Not like this. Jim's usual smart-ass grin was gone, and he just stood there, staring. I could tell he wanted to say something, but for once he was at a loss for words. I knelt down, trying to make sense of it. This wasn't a clean kill, it was brutal, chaotic. And worse, there were tracks around the body. Tracks I couldn't recognize. They were too large for any animal in these parts, and they definitely weren't human. I radioed back to the station, keeping my voice as steady as I could, asking for backup and the coroner. It was going to be a long day. We left the body there knowing it'd take a few hours for anyone else to reach us. Jim and I started to track the prints, carefully moving deeper into the ravine. I was hoping, praying really, that the other hiker was still alive, hiding somewhere. But the further we went, the more I knew we weren't going to find anything good. I've never seen anything like it. The forest was off. I don't mean in a supernatural kind of way, but in a way that made your skin crawl, like we weren't supposed to be there. It's hard to explain, but everything felt wrong. The air, the trees, even the damn birds were silent. We found more signs, though. Blood spatter here and there, another trail of those massive prints. Jim muttered under his breath about mountain lions, but I shut him down quick. Mountain lions don't leave footprints like that, hell nothing does. After a couple of miles, we came across something even worse. Another body, or at least part of one, tangled in the underbrush. This one was fresher, the blood still wet. But like the first, it was ripped apart. The head was missing. I had to walk away, gagging, trying to clear my head. Whatever had done this was still out there, and we were tracking it. That's when I heard Jim shout my name. I turned, and there, just a few yards behind him, something massive moved through the trees. It was fast, faster than anything I've ever seen. I yelled for Jim to run, but it was too late. The thing was on him before I could even draw my pistol. It wasn't until I saw it up close that I realized how wrong everything was. It wasn't a bear, not even close. It was like someone had stitched together pieces of different animals. A hulking, twisted form, muscles rippling under a patchwork of dark fur. Its hands were... wrong. Too long like it had fingers instead of paws, and its mouth. God, its mouth stretched open, unnaturally wide, with sharp, crooked teeth more suited to a predator from some nightmare. I watched as it tore into Jim. He didn't even have time to scream. Blood splattered the trees as the creature yanked him apart like a rag doll. I froze. I don't know how long I stood there, just staring. But when it looked up at me, I snapped out of it. Fight or flight kicked in and I ran, crashing through the undergrowth like a madman. 
I don't remember much about that part. Just running and trying not to trip over my own feet, the sound of something huge crashing through the trees behind me. It's funny what your mind does in moments like that. I remember thinking I shouldn't have eaten that last granola bar because I felt heavy, sluggish. I don't know how I managed to get away, but eventually I reached the edge of the ridge. I could see the trail ahead, but that thing was still behind me, closing in. My legs were burning, lungs screaming for air, but I wasn't stopping. I could feel it getting closer, hear the rustling leaves, the snapping branches. And then, just as I thought I was done for, I tripped. My foot caught on a root, and I went down hard. For a moment, everything went dark. When I came to, it was quiet, too quiet. I rolled over, half expecting to see that thing standing over me, but it was gone, just like that. Gone. I don't know why it didn't finish me off. Maybe it was already full from Jim, or maybe it got spooked by something else. Whatever the reason, I didn't care. I just needed to get out. I staggered back to the station hours later, covered in mud, blood, and leaves. The guys from the sheriff's department were already there, along with the coroner. I don't remember much about what I said, but I know they didn't believe me at first. Not until they found the bodies. They did a search of the area, of course, brought in some guys from Fish and Wildlife. But they never found that thing, just Jim's mangled body and those massive prints leading off into the forest. I didn't stay on the job much longer after that. They never said it, but I knew they thought I'd lost it, that I'd seen a bear and overreacted. But I know what I saw. Sometimes, late at night, I think about what happened out there, about that thing still roaming the woods. I don't go hiking anymore. Daniel Boone's a beautiful place, but there are some things out there you're not meant to see. They're still looking for the hikers who go missing every now and then. The forest, after all, is a big place. But I know one thing. Those woods keep their secrets.